automotive practice, which is looking at how do we make vehicles electrified, smart and connected and autonomous, but also our environmental practice where we, um, we, we have a, a strong smart cities program, looking at how cities can be integrated with the transport system, how those work together, um, and our ability to measure and predict urban air quality down to one cubic metre which allows us to understand what are the impacts of different transport policies um, and legislation on the, the urban built environment, the air quality. Um, and we're even designing um, apps for your phone which will allow you to see what the air quality is like in your, in your street so that you can actually chart how you might walk to the shops or walk to work uh, or take a ride to work so you can avoid the highest uh, polluting parts of the city. It's interesting and we, we have a very high focus on, on digitalisation and we differentiate between digitisation exactly, and yeah. digitalisation um, and for different parts of our business that represents quite different things. So if you look at the automotive world, digitalisation effectively means virtualisation of the product development process um, and that's driven by several factors. Um, one is speed to market, um, the ability to virtualise the, the testing effort and be able to do it simultaneously with the design process. Uh, we could halve the time we get to, to market and long-term forecasts suggesting uh, in 18 months or less. Okay. So there's a, there's a real advantage getting time to market. There's also a big cost advantage in eliminating vast quantities of prototype vehicles from the development process. The other challenge though is that we're going to have to move to the virtual world with these more complex systems. So if I take it in an autonomous, autonomous vehicle, we will never have the ability to certify or validate um, that product in the real world using hardware to test it. You know, we have to do millions of miles and we'll never get a product to market. So the only way of certifying and validating an autonomous vehicle is going to be through a virtual environment where we can we can run multiple use cases in parallel, we can run accelerated cycles. Um, and that is the next sort of big challenge because A, we don't know how to certify an autonomous vehicle, so what the standards are going to be. Um, and then what are the tools we're going to need in order to get and meet those standards and will these certifying bodies approve the tools right. because it's not going to be a physical validation, it'll be a virtual validation. That puts Ricardo in quite a good place. We have a very strong software business um, which is traditionally sought to offer software products for product development. Um, we're broadening that now into more systems optimization and complexity um, and we see a very strong role for our software business to extend into these new virtual products um, to allow us to, to do, create digital twins effectively um, and then use those digital twins in a virtual environment using agent-based modeling to then validate the product. Right. Um, pro probably in two, two areas. One is we have a large range of data ourselves from historic programs we've worked on with customers and we're mining that data um, to look at how that predicts trends for the future um, in terms of performance and functional requirements but also uh, creating improved designs um, based on that historic data. Um, one of the big next steps that we are in process of researching is how do we use machine learning and artificial intelligence to pull on that data set to create designs for the future? People talk a lot about machine learning uh, and data patterns and so on, which, which works well in the, the, the fintech industry and in Medicare, but for design, it's a whole different world. How do you teach um, a computer what a good design is? Exactly. Yeah? And, um, Autodesk, for example, have quite a good generative design tool which, which just basically mathematically calculates lots of different permutations um, which will achieve a goal. Actually, good use of machine learning will go a step beyond that and they'll look at what is a good design and use that background historic data set to then generate a range of solutions which I believe then human beings can then uh, decide what is the most appropriate one for that particular application. So that's one side where Ricardo is, is creating solutions in the market. The other one is, is more data analytics. We do a lot of that in our environmental practice. 
So looking at urban uh, emissions data, looking at urban traffic m movements, um, and, tr and using that data analytics to sift through and say, can we predict um, the change of air quality during a 24-hour cycle, for example? We can predict traffic movements using uh, traffic cameras and that kind of thing. We know from roadside emissions measurements what emissions that traffic will produce. We can then predict then what the air quality is going to be like and then feed, potentially feeding that data through to city authorities or, or users um, to say, do you want to restrict access to vehicles at three o'clock this afternoon because that will avoid a massive emission spike? Um, do you want to put up your tolling charges to, uh, to stop people coming in or do you want to physically ban them? Um, and do you want to tell the road users actually your sat nav should be taking you in different directions to try and minimise the impact of the city? So those are probably two of the major areas where we're developing solutions. Very much. Um, I think that um, it probably divides into autonomous and non-autonomous. Yeah? Um, I think that as we get more towards shared uh, vehicles, I think at the moment people are using standard vehicles and they're using them for shared uh, activity. I think as, as consumer demands grow, they're looking for more feature content in the vehicle when they're being transported, even if it's being uh, driven by a human being. And so they're going to want connectivity all online, they're going to want to have entertainment uh, systems in the vehicles, they want to have better passenger uh, layouts, all that kind of thing, which makes life uh, more uh, beneficial for them and makes them more productive uh, during their transport. Um, so we do see more of that. The latest London taxi is a good example, actually, of a, of a purpose-designed um, shared transportation product, which is a range extender vehicle. It's, it's designed for maximum comfort for the individuals inside, and, but it, it's not the full solution. Um, the other side of that is for autonomous transport, where you've got much more flexibility around seating arrangements. Uh, you're more likely to be able to get a large quantity of people in those vehicles. Um, and those will definitely require special purpose design. And with our interactions with, with a lot of, particularly the New Start organisations, we're seeing quite a few different designs coming through. Publicly stated companies like Zooks, right. as an example in the US, there are probably a dozen uh, solutions like that that are still in development that haven't been uh, publicly launched yet. Um, and the challenge there is, those organisations are looking for the advent of autonomy for those products to work, and that's not a solution which suits every market. I personally think that autonomy is not going to be a fast implementation here in India. I don't think the infrastructure, I don't think the driving style, I don't think the, the public are that interested in it. Um, I think shared mobility will very much be a prime mover here. Um, one of the areas that we are particularly interested in, actually, when you get to that that sort of purpose design vehicle is passenger comfort. And for us that's uh, MVH and chassis dynamics is one element, but actually car sickness or kinetosis is a is actually a big challenge which many people are not are not focused on at the moment. And and I don't know if you have children but I think we've all had situations where we're driving long journeys and our children get sick in the car. Yeah. And actually it's very well proven that children are much more susceptible to kinetosis because their, uh, their inner ear is not fully developed at that point. Um, but actually, in vehicles, car sickness is going to be a big actually differentiator for shared mobility. If you know that this type of vehicle, because it has um, designed in um, a good kinetosis, you'll choose that because you want to get across the city doing your texts and your emails or watching a film, and you don't want to get out feeling sick. And so we're starting to develop some solutions which are, um, if you like, non-intrusive, okay. which will improve uh, path planning or chassis setup or air conditioning in the vehicle. Controlling the lighting in the vehicle is also a big feature, which means that we can measure the susceptibility of the individuals and then start to actively manage the ride quality and the ride condition so that people get out the other end feeling um, as good or better than when they got in the vehicle. I think there's been a very uh, large amount of hype around EVs being the solution. And I think in the long term that is probably the right answer. 
Um, however, it's going to take us a long time to get there. Right. There are lots of issues. Price point for battery systems, uh, charging infrastructure, um, there's a lot of invested capital around combustion systems. Um, um, and also, combustion engine vehicles are becoming cleaner and more efficient all the time. Exactly. Um, so, our understanding and our best predictions are that even by 2030, mm -hmm. uh, full EV penetration is probably only going to be around 15 to 20 percent, which means that we have a, a vast amount of the, of the car park still going to be running combustion engine vehicles. Does that mean to say we should slow down our development? No, absolutely not. Um, I think there is a significant role for, for hybrid systems, particularly as, as battery costs come down, their price point becomes more uh, attractive. And so strong hybridization is a path to full electrification. Um, I think that um, there is definitely a role still to be played in uh, advanced combustion engines as range extenders. Right. So we're going to see a move. At the moment, we are adding more and more and more technology and cost to combustion engines. Um, I think there's going to be a tipping point, probably in five years' time, where we're going to, because of the uh, price point of batteries, means we can strengthen the electrified side of the vehicle product. We can then start to afford to take technology off the combustion engine as it becomes a smaller and smaller component in a range extended product. And um, that, I think, will continue to be the path until we completely phase out the, the combustion engine vehicle. The other side of that is um, Class A and heavy goods vehicle transportation. Right now, we see no viable alternative to liquid fuels. It just doesn't have the energy density. And so we'll continue to work and see improvements in thermal efficiency for uh, liquid fueled engines. We will see uh, gas uh, engines. Um, and our role we see is how do we help the industry find more efficient uh, means of use of those engines? So our latest uh, cryopower split cycle uh, combustion process gets us to about 60% thermal efficiency, which is astounding um, compared to where we are now. And we are within reach of that um, over the next four to five years. Um, and the other side of that is clean fuels. So can we decarbonize the fuel through use, more use of biofuels, right. but then going to synthetic fuels. Exactly. Um, so again, we see long-term use of combustion engines there. Mm. Uh, very interesting topic because I think there is a, a there's a technical perception or a technical understanding, and then there is uh, politics and public perception. Mm. Um, and Dieselgate has massively influenced uh, the whole public perception piece along with, with uh, urban air quality and, and it is very true that um, historic emissions levels have not, allowed, have not driven diesels to support good air quality in city environments. So, so diesels have been a major contributor to that. Um, however, Euro 6, uh, Barrett Stage 6, will produce actually very clean diesel engines and they will probably no longer contribute to poor air quality in cities. However, there is pretty much a guaranteed public perception that diesels are dirty, yeah. um, and, and so we are seeing a continued drop down in diesel sales in Europe and dramatically, I think, in India. Um, and those are the two uh, geographies where diesel and passenger cars have traditionally had a very big uh, element. Other areas like the US and China and Southeast Asia, diesels do not play a big part anywhere. So I think we're going to see a continual decline in diesels in passenger car vehicles. I think it, it will still be retained at a small level, particularly in, in luxury vehicles, where there's, you know, there's still a reasonable um, basis for having them as an efficient powertrain source, and also for, for people who want to travel long distances. You know, they still are a sensible alternative. Um, but it's very much going to become a niche, I think. Um, and obviously commercial vehicles is the other area. And, and long haul, as we've talked about, will still be diesel or clean diesel alternative. The interesting other difference there is, is um, uh, light and medium goods vehicles, particularly for urban applications. So uh, delivery vehicles, mm -hmm. at the moment there's a lot of diesel delivery vehicles. We're going to see a move, I think, towards um, gasoline hybrid or full electric. Um, so we're going to see long-haul vehicles decanting into local delivery vehicles which are probably full electric uh, or potentially fuel cell and then you've got fully clean vehicles doing the urban distribution 
uh, recharging in a depot and then going back out on the circulation. Um, I, I think it's a real it's a real frustration in the industry because I think the vehicle manufacturers and the consultants I regard we see um, the real world benefits of using diesel. Yeah. But the political and the public perception against it basically means that, that there is very little funding available, very little research, very little appetite to support further diesel development. And so it just feels like there is a solution there to be had, technically, but there is very little appetite in order to push it through. Um, so a lot of the clients we're talking to um, really aren't doing very much work anymore. Uh, there's, there's optimization, but we see almost every month another vehicle manufacturer saying that's the last diesel we're going to do. Um, and uh, I just think that where there is no appetite in the market for that solution, even if it is technically the right solution, I, I think the, the, the responsibility on the manufacturers is to provide the, the market what it wants. Well, I think that um, the, the big push towards automated transmissions is a big bonus here. Um, because what, once you get into an automated transmission, be it a full automatic or, or a DCT or an automated manual, that starts to lend itself naturally to hybridization. Um, and uh, so we're seeing, particularly for DCTs, it's very, it's very easy to add an um, uh, electric motor to a DCT. Um, it's not a big package uh, implication and your control system can very easily manage the, the power flows for that. Um, I think one of the areas we see significant development in is what we would call a dedicated hybrid transmission. Right. In that if you know that pretty much all of your vehicles are going to have some level of uh, automation and some level of hybridization, uh, it means that you can design your transmission around that feature content um, so you don't, you could, it's, for me it's kind of a glorified AMT mm -hmm. and so a lot of the drawbacks you have from the AMT in terms of shift quality and uh, drive uh, driver perception, you can do a lot of that talking film and shift quality change with the motor that you've got in your transmission. So you can go for a much lower cost overall transmission itself with the addition of the electric motor and have a, a better user experience at the end. Um, and so we are seeing, we're developing a lot of technology around dedicated hybrid transmissions, um, which then support, I think, the um, different levels of hybridization. So um, we, we see quite a significant penetration for 48 volt systems. So you've got very mild 20, 25 kilowatt motor, which is providing you with um, a power boost. It, it, it improves shift quality and in fact you can put it into gearboxes you can put it as a belt starter generator as well depending on your your interest uh, but that fits very nicely actually even within your gearbox so it's a very compact solution um, good performance aspects and good fuel economy improvements um, and that's equally applicable uh, as one of our papers presented this morning to both passenger cars and light goods vehicles as well so yeah hybridized transmissions I think have a real opportunity, particularly to take cost out of transmissions as well as provide feature content as well.